At any um, at any point in the book, did you feel like changing it into a fantasy and making Cassie come back to life or something? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, obviously, this is the first book where I've played with magical realism. Um, and I love fantasy and science fiction. When I was your age, those are the only books that I would read would be fantasies and science fiction. And you can do so much from the writing perspective um, with fantasy and mythology. Um, I don't think I dared to do it with this book. I probably will at some point. This book for me was, um, you know, borrowing uh, with a lot of respect. Because you'll, you'll notice in the book, I also mentioned the fantasy authors who I love and respect: Neil Gaiman, Jane Yolen, Tamara Pierce. Those are the books that these girls are reading. Um, and so I kind of wanted to borrow some of those elements, but I didn't quite have the courage to go the whole way. What made you like want to write about this? Like this subject and about these girls. Yeah, what, yeah. I get a lot of versions of that question. Sometimes I like I'll be at a school and a kid will say, "Finally, lady, do you need a shrink? <laughs> <laughs> you seem really messed up. You know, you keep on writing about people who are almost dead or messed up." And um, well, the first thing is, is that who wants to read a book about happy people? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> um, actually, my, my book Prom has got a little bit lighter. You know, it's a fun, it's a little bit, nobody dies. That's good. Um, but I, I think for me, um, y you guys are, I love you. I care so much about adolescent readers. And a large part of that is because I had a very difficult adolescence. My family was going through hell when I was a teenager. It was, it was horrible and it was ugly and it was scary. And we moved, and my parents were freaking out, and it was just a mess. And we got through it. You know, I, I got through high school because I had, I, I hid in the library, and I read a lot. And I had a couple of teachers who, who loved me. You know, I knew they cared about me when I didn't think my parents cared about me. And so I had those adults in my life, and I made it through. Um, but I could, there was a very good chance that I wasn't going to, because I was definitely capable of doing really stupid, boneheaded things as a teenager. And so now that I've kind of gotten on the other side of that as an adult, as a mom, you know, I have four kids of my own, I watch them and their friends go through adolescence. And, and I, I want to, I kind of feel I have a job. My job is to write stories that will help, not all of you, but maybe some of you, find the courage to go through another day. You know, maybe for, maybe for some of you it'll just be like a great story, whatever. And I hope you don't have to write too many essays about them, because you just need books that you're going to enjoy. But there are definitely kids who have read my books and written to me and said, you know, I went and told somebody I was sexually assaulted because of your book, or you know, I didn't kill myself, or and this happens to all YA authors. It's not just me. If we're writing stories that connect with our readers, well, a lot of our readers are in difficult places. So. Um, and then, yeah, there is some truth to the fact that it's cheaper than therapy. Because I will say that by writing this book and really looking at what kind of, of self-hatred and pain and depression leads a person into eating disorders made me hold up a mirror to my own eating disordered habits. And, and it was like, ooh, you know, pot calling the kettle black here. And I think has helped get me get to a healthier place with being able to enjoy food, being able to live a healthy life. We don't have scales in our house anymore. We never will. You know, so that's cool. Uh, what kind of music do you think Leah would listen to? Because um, in the dream part where she was, um, it seemed she was dreaming that a spider was coming out of her belly button. Yeah. It sort of reminded me of a Marilyn Manson music video. Ooh. And I was, yeah, what kind of music do you think she would listen Ooh, to? Oh, that is such a good question. I think, I don't know that she would be Marilyn Manson. Because I think, um, it's almost like she's she's like too depressed for that. The kids who the kids I know who like Marilyn Manson and, and, and those kinds of groups um, are angry. <laughs> they're not just they're, they're just they are actively angry and uh, usually because they have a lot of things to be angry about. Um, I I could see Leah Moore listening to trance music, you know, because she wants to be numb. She just wants to go away in her head, and so um, you know just you know house music or just something just with the rhythms that'll just uh, make the world go away. Like uh, Cirque du Soleil or something? Yeah, something like that. What do you think? Uh, you think Marilyn Manson? I don't know. I would think that sometimes if she wanted to go away and 
be in a trance, then yeah, like something like Evanescence, maybe. Yes, yes, Evanescence is, that's right. Evanescence should do the soundtrack to this book. <laughs> that's what you should listen to. Actually, if you go to my website, we're working on it right now, but pretty soon we'll have the playlist up. And the playlist lists, not all of them, I should put all of them, but I had my own playlist on my computer that I would listen to when I was writing it. And not so much, some of the songs definitely tie into the, that mindset of the book, but a lot of them were songs that I listened to to put me in the right emotional place to do the writing. And Effinescence is definitely on there. Yeah, and uh, I would think that maybe Numb by Linkin Park would go yes. in later in the book because yes. she was uh, sort of realizing that she was, that she needed to help herself and everything, and that she was realizing that she was sort of, yeah. yeah. I think Linkin Park um, Crawling, that is like, to me, that if that was sort of, if that music had been around when I was a teenager, that would have been my anthem. And I think kids who are struggling with stuff, I think I could see Elijah, um, the character of Elijah, totally being in, hooked into that music. Yeah, I thought Elijah might have been disturbed or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Were you mad at me about anything in the book? Any point you wanted to <laughs> fling the book across the room? Come on, be honest. No? Yeah, you were. And Elijah stole the money. And Elijah stole the money. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I thought they were gonna like, go out on the road and fall in love and it would be a happy little love story. There were only like 30 too. pages on it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was still hoping. You were hoping, yeah. yeah. Do you know why that, I, I, you know, I thought about it. I, there's, I, there's just million, 10 million things you can do in a book. But I realized that if that happened, if they went off into the sunset or whatever, she still wouldn't be facing with and dealing with and solving her own problems. And that's sort of what we all have to figure out because nobody can solve your problems for you. Everybody can offer help, you know, and everybody in this book is offering her help. And none of it works until she's ready for herself to start walking towards health. And that's why he has to leave. Yeah, it, it, I didn't want him to be like the person who saved her at the end of the day because because it's just like it's something that no one can save you from. You have to do it yourself. That's right. And that's, that Cinderella stuff. Yeah. Yeah, they lied. <laughs> <laughs> there is no guy in a white horse or girl in a white horse. If it, it just they lied. Yeah. You got to figure it out on your own. I. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I just I thought the book sort of reminded me of that old uh, children's book, The Paperback Princess. Oh, oh what a nice herself. thing to compare it to. Yes, I like that book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I was thinking about how um, Leah, she's, I read, um, what was that book called? You gave me like two years ago about the anorex, the best little girl in the world. I didn't read that. Is that a good book? It's a good one. Yeah. Um, and in the book, um, the character, I forget her name, um, but she was just Tessa, I think. Mm -hmm. She was really um, happy with being it being anorexic, she was proud of herself, but in this book, Leah was more, she didn't really like it, it seemed like it was, something else was pushing her, and then like, I kind of figured out at the end that it was Cassie that was kind of prompting her on to be anorexic, like. And, and, and I think too, that if I had structured the book differently, and like, entered into Leah's life, uh, really, and starting in eighth grade and moving forward, you would see the years when the eating disorder felt like it was working for her because it was giving her feelings of, I mean, you know, if you're, it, it does give some people feelings of control yeah. and success and strength. And that's why the behavior continues because it's rewarding in a very unhealthy kind of way. Um, and, but I chose in this book to start kind of the critical um, compelling event that sets the, 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 the changes in motion and then flash back to pick up pieces of her childhood. But yeah, you're right. That's why it's so darn hard to deal with. Because it does work for a while, like all addictions. Keeps things out. <laughs> <laughs>